All right, recording has started, and uh, once the recording is done, we'll be posting a link to this uh, to the recording on our blog, and we'll probably just split it up and upload it to the YouTube as well. Okay, uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you or uh, if you want to, you know, send a quick chat message, please use the the control panel, and you should be able to quickly communicate with us. This way, I'll be monitoring periodically uh, the screen for the. Um, for any questions that you might have. All right, so let's get let's get started. Uh, what you see on the screen is the Web Warp Management Console. Uh, Web Warp RTMP server is automatically uh, included and automatically started when you run Web Warp. To give you an overview of how things are set up in, our, in the RTMP land when it comes to Web Warp, I'm going to go into my uh, Web Warp setup. So this is 4.3.0. Uh, messaging server is started. Uh, by the code included in global.asax, and I'll tell you the reason why it is done this way. Uh, in here, if we look, there is a application underscore start uh, event that is fired by ASP.NET when, when the very first request enters uh, your ASP.NET application with WebWarp. There is code here which will create an instance of the RTMP server on this specific port, and it starts the server. Sometimes uh, you may notice that when you do the very first request uh, for your ASP.NET application where WebWarp is running, it may take a little bit of time. The reason it takes time actually has nothing to do with WebWarp, but what it has to do is, is the fact that there is code in global.asax and .NET automatically compiles this file and runs it, and that compilation takes, takes, takes a little bit of time. As a result, you will see that it, uh, it may take longer on the very first request. Now, the, another side effect of, of having this code in here is that if you are using nothing but messaging, so let's say you're building an RTMP application, and you were to uh, connect to your app, if there is no ASPX or if there is no pure.NET HTTP-based request, then there was nothing to run this code. As a result, the messaging server may not be running at all. So one of the best practices, or one of the practices that we recommend, is in your uh, flex code or in your really any code that uses messaging, make sure to put an HTTP request. Just let's say do a, a remoting invocation that will target your backend, just so the messaging server can wake up or you know really run, and uh, and that will get the whole thing going. So this is this is where the messaging server is is started. Uh, in 4.3, we added a special code that if the server is bounced for whatever reason, and I'll uh, later today in this webinar I'll talk about the reasons why it could, could be bounced. We added code that will automatically restart it. So uh, that was a problem previously, but in 4.3, the the messaging server is automatically restarted if it is bounced. Now. In, back in the management console, if you go to the messaging server tab, you will see a list of all the messaging applications uh, deployed and recognized by WebWorld. All of these applications, from the deployment perspective, are really just folders located under the applications folder. So when you install WebWorld, you will have this applications folder, and under that, there's going to be a bunch of directories. So each of these directories is, an, is a messaging application. and uh, the concept of messaging application is fairly important when you build RTMP-based apps. And the importance of it is that every single application creates a separate scope. And what that scope really means is that multiple clients could connect to any given application, and then all of the connections, all of the streams, would it be media streams or remote shared objects, would be recognized in the context of that scope. So if one client connects to, let's say, scope chat, and another client connects to scope messaging service. And those are going to be two separate connections that will not be visible to each other. So as I said, all of these are individual messaging applications. And as we start building our examples, you'll see how these come, in, come into play. Let me check if there are any pending questions here. All right, so um, I'll, there are a few questions, but I'll, I'll save them for a little bit later today. So the very first uh, example that I, ha I have prepared several examples, but the very first one that I have that I would like to uh, review with you is just the, the most basic video player. So in this case, uh, what I have is an ultra-trivial application where there's really just one uh, 
one tag, which is video player. And uh, the, this, this video player has this particular URL as the source. So let's take a look at this URL. So first of all, it starts with RTMP colon slash slash, meaning that the, the, the actual data transfer protocol between the client and the server is going to be RTMP. Second of all, we are connecting to this particular port. And you already saw this port in global.asax right here. So this is the port that the RTMP server is started on. You can, you can change this port to whatever you want to, or you can use our uh, RTMP tunneling, RTMPT, and in this case, if you use tunneling, the port is going to be port 80. But for now, for the simplicity's sake, let's just go with the default, so 2037. And this is what this number is here. After that, we have slash video player. So this, this is the name of our messaging application that we will be connecting to. And uh, as, as, as I already said, this messaging applications are defined here. So in this case, I have slash video player. So there's going to be a folder called video player. So we're going to be connecting to this particular application. And right after that, there is a name of a, of a file, starcraft.mp4. And that's just a video file located inside of this video player application. In, in fact, if I go inside a video player, there is a special folder called streams. So if you were to uh, distribute any kind of videos and uh, uh, create, let's say, a video player in your app, and all the static streams would need to be located inside of the streams folder. And in fact, in this one, I do have this starcraft.mp4. Uh, once I run this app, runs the browser, and uh, it's going to load the actual app. The combination of Internet Explorer and, and Flash Builder is not the best for, for, for the webinar and demo purposes. But anyway, so here it is. We, we have this video that it, that it started streaming, so it shows the length. And all the functionality is provided automatically by, by the video player component. So here it is. Here's the video. If at this time we were to switch to the management console and uh, go to uh, this messaging server, you notice that the video player shows uh, this different icon, meaning that there is a there is a live connection to this guy. So in here we can see all the stats. So here it is. There is one connection, and this is the output traffic, the input traffic, and in fact we can see our connection right here under the connections, and this is going to be our connection that streams the video. We can fast forward, and it's just going to go down there. And once I close this uh, browser. This connection here should go away. Here it is. It's gone away, and there are no pending connections, or there are no active connections to the video player application. So just to review the code, it is very straightforward and probably the most basic you can get. So let me take a look if there are any questions. All right. Uh, each application should use a different port number. No. So uh, all of the applications that you deploy in your web orb, web orb instance are going to be running in under that RTMP server. So there's one RTMP server that got started, and all of these apps are running under the same port. So you'll be to the same port right here, but you'll be specifying different application name in your URLs. So all the ports are being shared. OK, so there's a question uh, about RTMP. Uh, we, we'll, we'll definitely talk about it, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd rather go through all, the, all of the examples and then talk about RTMP, and all, not, all, not just RTMPT, but RTMPS, which is uh, something that is also very important, comes up very frequently in the discussions. All right. So there is a, there is a, a comment that uh, someone would like to see a demo of recording a video from webcam on server to have like FLV. Yes, I do have an example that covers just that. So you'll, you'll be able to see that example here today as well. So the ports can be reused. Right, so you could, you could actually, in your global.asax, uh, you, we start a server on port 2037. But you can actually start more than one RTMP server right here. So you can just create additional lines and allocate different ports to each RTMP server. So different servers cannot run on the same port, but you can have as many RTMP servers on as many ports as you want. And all of those ports will coexist in the context of the same web orb instance. 
let me check the next. Uh, so the, all, of, all of these folders, so the, the, the question is whether all of these folders need to be installed under program files web work. Uh, no, they, they, they don't need to be. They need to be a part of an ASP.NET application where WebWarp is installed. Uh, something that I hear quite often is when you run WebWarp installer and it creates this default installation, by default it is program files, WebWarp.NET, and the version number, and then you get the full installation of WebWarp. So this is not the installation of WebWarp. It is really just a reference installation where you can see everything that running out of the box. But you can easily deploy WebWarp into any of your uh, applications. And uh, if you were to deploy WebWarp into your ASP.NET app, then you, you, and you are using RTMP, and then you should have the applications folder in the context of your app with all of the messaging applications declared in there. OK, uh, question on whether there is a dynamic adaptive streaming. We'll talk about it later as well. Uh, and tunneling. Okay, so so these are all the questions that I have at this point, and let's go back to to the next example. So uh, now that we talked about the actual streaming, one of the uh, cool features that, uh, well, in my opinion, a co cool features you may not think so, but so let let me know, uh, is, is is something that that is called server side streaming. So imagine a scenario where you start a stream on the server, and you different and different clients can connect. And you want to create a virtual movie theater, for the lack of a better word. So this way, once the stream is started, different clients should be able to connect to that stream and watch the whole thing uh, really at the same at the same uh, timestamps, right? So if, if if someone is watching something, then anybody else needs to be watching exactly the same thing uh, by connecting to the same application. So here's uh, here's this example that I put together for service side streaming. And let's take a look at the at the design of this application first. All right, so it's it's very very basic. Uh, there are two buttons, one to start broadcast if it hasn't started, and uh, if the broadcast is started and right now we'll just know whether it started or not. We could include some additional visual indicators, but for the simplicity's sake, uh, let's say a user comes in and they can either start the broadcast or they can connect to another live stream. So this is going to be our uh, video container. We will place a uh, video in there. And this is just the text area uh, that we're going to use as the log. So let's go through the source code of this, of this example. So first of all, when the application starts on the application complete, it calls the init method. And inside of the init, we will create a net connection uh, at the that status uh, event listener and also connect to the specific service side application. So once again, the URL is going to be familiar to you. However, the name is different, so it is server streaming. So it's just a different scope, different context. Uh, once we get any kind of event, we will add it to our log. Uh, and there are two buttons, as I mentioned. There is start broadcast and connect to stream. So start broadcast is right here. And there is just one, it's one liner. And what we do is we uh, invoke a service side function using this net connection. And we pass in the name of the FOV that we want to include in the broadcast. Uh, whenever we call connect to stream, uh, this is the function right here, we create a stream object. And we're connecting to the stream that is going to be called this. So this starts the stream, this connects to the stream. And then dynamically, we're going to create the video object, add it to UI component, and then add this UI component to our video container, which is just a VBox. Okay? And then attach our video object to the net stream. So fairly trivial code. And I'll be posting all of this code to the blog so you can you can have access to that as well. 